Hey folks, as people are still starting to join us, um, it's just now noon central time. Um, as people are just continuing to join us, go ahead and answer this poll. I've got one more after this, just to kind of get a feel for who's in our audience today. So it says that percent of the audience has voted, and of that, uh, about 54% of you say you're from the Midwest, 23% from Mid-Atlantic, and 16 to 17% from the Northeast. 5% of you are joining us from the West, and 3% of you said other. So looks like the mid-atlantic percentage is now going up we've got about 30 percent from mid-atlantic and 48 percent from the midwest all right so we've got a little bit of a feel for who's in the audience i'm going to close this one and open up another poll just to kind of get a feel for people's background levels or background um experiences and stuff related to water quality See the answers rolling in. Looks like we've got a pretty good mix with us today. So looks like the common common answer is the second to last. Um, people saying above average work, volunteered, or learned about it. 23% um, of you chose the second option, saying you still have lots to learn, but you know the basics. 21% uh, or now 20% say that you're an expert or a professional in this field. 15% of you say you have a moderate level of understanding and 4% said none to very little. All right, so we've been, we're a few minutes past our start time. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this and get started. Thank you guys all for participating. Um, and thanks for joining us today, everybody. So uh, my name is Zach Moss. I'm the Midwest Save Our Streams Coordinator with the Isaac Walton League of America. And today we have with us Kyle Danley, the Chief Operating Officer of Des Moines Waterworks, based out of Des Moines, Iowa, and Catherine Baer, who is the Director of Science and Policy with River Network, based out of Carborough, North Carolina. Um, and today we're just going to be talking a little bit about uh, drinking water and water quality, how they're related, and how that um, relates to you as a consumer and a citizen. Um, Kyle and Catherine have both put together some nice presentations and they've got a lot to offer you today. But before I uh, pass it over to them, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, this webinar will be recorded, so uh, you can look for a recording to be posted to the Isaac Walton League of America YouTube channel in a couple of days after this. Uh, every one of our attendees should get an automatic email with that link, so just keep an eye on your inbox for that. If you want to um, look at it afterwards, um, you can also, you should have a chat box on, should be on the right side of your screen. So throughout the presentations, feel free to use that to make questions or comments. Um, we don't have a, a true chat like Zoom, so other participants won't be able to see what you what you enter in there, but I will be moderating in the background. Um, I can answer questions and um, we'll also hopefully have some time for a little Q&A session at the end. So if there are any questions for the group that can wait till the end, go ahead and just pop them in there. And I'll pull those out at the end. We can share those with everybody and um, see what Catherine and Kyle have to say about those. Um, and with that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and pass it off to Kyle um, to tell us a little bit about source water pollution and some of the issues and challenges that Des Moines Water Works faces um, as it relates to turning source water to drinking water. So just give me a moment. I'll pass the baton over to Kyle. All right, you should be the presenter and be able to share your screen now, Kyle. All right. Screen? 
Yep, looking good. Very good. Thanks, Zach. As Zach mentioned, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Des Moines Waterworks. Uh, I've worked for the utility about 23 years. I'm an engineer by trade, uh, but got into operations uh, in the water treatment plant probably four or five years ago. And certainly we've seen our challenges with that. So hopefully I can share some of that uh, with you all. Um, to start off though, most of you are, I'm assuming are not from Iowa, or many of you are not from Iowa. So I thought I'd give you a little background on Des Moines Waterworks. Um, Des Moines Waterworks originally was formed as a private water utility in 1871, uh, but was subsequently uh, turned into a public water utility in 1919. So in fact, we celebrated our 100 year anniversary as being a public utility uh, last year. We provide uh, water to 500,000 customers, basically in central Iowa. So half of our, over half of our water sales are to our wholesale customers um, throughout central Iowa. Here's our service area, primarily four counties uh, in central Iowa, along with uh, a several or a dozen or so of our wholesale customers in the suburbs uh, surrounding Des Moines. Uh, Des Moines Waterworks has three treatment plants and three aquifer storage and recovery wells. So for those of you who are not familiar with aquifer storage and recovery, um, in, in Iowa, there's a Jordan aquifer over a thousand foot deep uh, where in the winter months, we can inject uh, nearly uh, 300 million or 400 million gallons of finished water uh, down into the Jordan aquifer alluvium where we can then recover that in the summer months uh, for three months in time to recover about 3 million gallons per day uh, of clean drinking water. Uh, this was uh, constructed to help shave uh, the peak demand periods in the summer months, uh, but now can also be used during water quality challenges when we wanna minimize the amount of time that we're taking uh, surface water uh, for the treatment. Uh, of the three plants, we average about 45 million gallons per day. Uh, today we're doing probably close to 60 uh, million gallons. Uh, we've had a peak pumpage in 2012, 96 million gallons. Uh, and we maintain about 1,500 miles of distribution pipe. Uh, it's important to note that our three treatment plants are surface water treatment plants. Uh, surface water uh, has a lot more regulation uh, than uh, those that are using groundwater only. And so our three plants are all surface water. The fluor dry water treatment plant is the original uh, treatment plant constructed over 100 years ago or parts of it over 100 years ago. Uh, conventional treatment with lime softening capable of about 75 million gallons per day. In 2000, uh, the McMullen water treatment plant uh, was constructed. Um, it was also, it's also a conventional water treatment plant of 25 million gallons per day. And let me go back a little bit on the fluor drive plant. We have three water sources for fluor drive, uh, one being the Raccoon River. Uh, we have an intake on the Des Moines River, and then we also have uh, the gallery system that we'll talk a little bit about. On uh, McMullen, uh, we have also three sources of water for that treatment plant, uh, one being radio collector wells, which are shallow uh, wells that project out underneath the river. Um, and then we have uh, a gravel pit that we can take some water and we pump water into and can take water out of and get some natural denitrification occurring in that uh, small body of water. And then we have uh, the Maffet Reservoir, which was originally constructed by Des Moines Waterworks as an emergency water supply uh, for quantity, uh, but now we use it not only for quantity uh, for the McMullen water treatment plant, but we can also use that when we have water quality challenges uh, that we'll talk a little bit about. And then lastly, uh, about 10 years ago, the Sailorville water treatment plant was constructed. This is a completely different technology. Here we have membrane uh, treatment with ultrafiltration and reverse osmosis, uh, capable of about 10 million gallons per day. Uh, with that treatment process, it's more expensive to operate that plant, it takes more energy uh, and a little more um, labor uh, to run that, but certainly uh, addresses a lot of the water quality concerns uh, that we see uh, with the other two plants and taking direct surface water. Here's our a map of our uh, area. Um, I'll note the McMullen Water Treatment Plant located in Southwest Polk County. Uh, the fluor treatment plant is located just south of Des Moines or of the downtown Des Moines. Uh, here we have the Raccoon River intake is next to this plant. Uh, the Des Moines River intake is just between, uh, is north, a few miles north of the plant along the Des Moines River uh, near Prospect Park, about halfway between that and the Sailorville treatment plant, which is up north. So uh, near Johnston and Ankeny in the Sailorville Reservoir. Uh, here are some of our ground storage and elevated storage uh, reservoirs 
that we uh, own and maintain, certainly much more in the system, uh, but those are the ones that we maintain, not the suburbs. Uh, the gallery system was the original water system for the Fluor Drive uh, water treatment plant. It is a very uh, unique system, one of the first of its kind that was constructed, and essentially it is a um, horizontal tiling system, but it's large size. It's about 40 feet down uh, into the alluvial bed and sands and gravels. It parallels the Raccoon River uh, and they're uh, basically four foot diameter concrete tile rings that butt up next to each other. So with this uh, system that was installed, uh, some of it over a hundred years ago, um, was the primary supply of water to uh, the Des Moines Water Works until the 1940s. Uh, when it became uh, not enough quantity of water. But it is our pristine water quality. Certainly it's influenced by the rivers. Um, we also have created ponds in our parks that you can see in the aerial photography. And here we pump water from the rivers into there to saturate the groundwater source so that we can maximize our uh, production that we can get out of the gallery system. Typically we can get about 20 million gallons per day of water uh, from this source. Our Raccoon River intake is also located um, right here, but this is uh, the gallery is a very important part of our treatment process, especially here at Fluor Drive. Talk a little bit about riverbank filtration. Um, this is an example of our well systems that we have at the, uh, the Sailorville treatment plant and the McMullen water treatment plant. Uh, this particular is an example of a radio collector well where you have a case on in the center, uh, 12 or 15 foot diameter. It may go down 40 feet or down to bedrock. And then from there, they project 12-inch uh, screens, 300 feet out of stainless steel screens that uh, project out underneath the river and parallel to the river. So they're taking that uh, groundwater and surface water uh, that's coming in and then being naturally filtered through the sand and gravel layers, uh, providing a much uh, better quality of water uh, to be treated. The gallery system is very similar, except you would just have one tile system that's running parallel does not have all these laterals that are coming off of it. That's why it's uh, the length is several miles long. I don't have time today to go through the treatment process, but if those that are interested in understanding how the water treatment process works at Des Moines Waterworks, in particular our uh, fluor water treatment plant, there's a YouTube video online that you can see. Just type in Des Moines Waterworks treatment process and this will come up. It's a nice animated video about 11 minutes long, kind of help explain our process. Some of you have member uh, that live in Iowa certainly remember the 1993 flood. Uh, unfortunately, we made national news during that time uh, where we flooded our treatment plant out. At that time, we only had the fluor drive treatment plant. Uh, it is up here in the top left corner uh, where we had uh, no water, drinking water for our citizens or even for sanitation purposes for several weeks. Uh, below is our office building. So you can see it was inundated uh, by that 1993 flood. Others may have heard of us, uh, Des Moines Waterworks, with our lawsuit that we did to three counties in uh, northwestern Iowa, where we sued those three counties trying to uh, get the importance of uh, point source pollutions that are occurring and trying to get regulation for that. And so here's an example of a multiple point source um, pollution that is coming in uh, that is non-regulated. Unfortunately, that lawsuit was uh, rejected by uh, the courts and uh, did not go on. Uh, the other thing I want to mention this year, it's created some challenges with us as we've had a drought in Iowa. Uh, we had some recent rains in the past two weeks that certainly have helped but have not eliminated. But in August, we were seeing uh, severe to extreme drought in our watershed, especially the Raccoon River watershed, uh, which is up in this uh, red to uh, yellowish or um, orangish area. Um, the Des Moines watershed is kind of more northern of us, so we were seeing significant um, levels of decreased river flow, which also uh, tends to bring more water quality challenges that we'll share uh, that we've been seeing this summer. So just kind of a graph to really show uh, what the rivers have been doing in the last three or four months. We have four main challenges. Uh, certainly have a lot of challenges, but these are the four main water quality challenges that uh, we'll talk about today, nitrates. Uh, certainly we fight to be compliant there to stay under the 10 milligram per liter um, MCL uh, that we have. Uh, TOCs uh, are also uh, can be challenging for us in the spring, which can create disinfection byproducts. Uh, ammonia, also something that we see in the spring, 
uh, is challenging. This really impacts our uh, disinfection. Ammonia, uh, it takes seven parts of chlorine to neutralize one part of ammonia. So when we get high levels of ammonia in our raw water, we have to feed a lot of chlorine, sometimes greater than 10 times the normal amount uh, to neutralize that ammonia to make sure that we have a free corn residual in the distribution system uh, to be protectant uh, of our system. And then lastly, uh, algae, cyanobacteria, and cyanotoxins. Those are kind of the big buzzwords the last six years or so uh, after we had the uh, Toledo, Ohio water crisis there in 2014. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And certainly those are the ones that uh, are giving us some our most challenges this year. Uh, water quality in, in Iowa, the issues are real. Uh, those that are in the public health role see this. Uh, we have uh, very challenging rivers and things and our margins are sometimes much too narrow. And so hopefully uh, I got a lot of graphs that I'll share today. You'll kind of see some of those challenges that we see and see how uh, quickly that, that can change. I know this is a busy graph, but it really goes through to the point to show uh, what I call the four seasons of water quality, at least for us uh, in the uh, rivers that we see in Iowa. Uh, we'll start out here at the first line in January is the blue line is nitrates. Uh, typically we see in, uh, moderately high nitrates in January and February. They're starting to decline a little bit. Um, and then in March, when we get the spring melt, uh, we'll get a lot of dilution you'll see nitrates will, will drop. Again, that is likely as a result of the dilution that is seeing. At the same time that that's happening, unfortunately, our TOC and our ammonia levels are spiking very high. And so that is uh, all caused from the snow melt, uh, the runoff coming off, and then the ice uh, that's breaking up in the rivers, churning the organics in the bottom of the river and stirring everything up. It's probably one of our most challenging times for a couple of weeks uh, to try to deal with that. We get a lot of taste and odor or can get a lot of taste and odor issues as a result of that. Once the spring melt uh, subsides, the rivers start to come down again. You'll see the nitrates will start climbing again back to the levels that they were. Uh, um, farmers will start adding extra fertilizers on. We'll start to see the nitrogen levels climbing again until we get, they kind of peak out typically in July or August. About that time, uh, farm ground, the crops are starting to absorb some of those nutrients in the ground. We're starting to see some decline there. We're also seeing the water temperatures are warming up in the rivers. And then unfortunately, we're getting algae and cyanobacteria starting to grow, which loves to feed off of um, the nutrients in the water and the nitrates in the water. So they're consuming those nutrients. Uh, nitrates decline down towards the end of, end of summer and the early part of uh, fall. At the same time, when that's happening, because of the blue-green algae that's starting to form and the cyanobacteria, we, we also can get uh, toxins starting to form or microcystin uh, that form, and then those will decline off as the water temperatures become cooler, and then the nitrogen, the crops are removed, and then more uh, fertilizers are added, and then uh, nitrate levels begin to climb uh, once again. The nitrate concentrations uh, in the Raccoon River have been uh, steadily glowing up. Certainly they vary year to year, but this graph can illustrate uh, that the trend line uh, since 1974 has certainly uh, been up. We've had some years where that's uh, not as prevalent, but you can see generally speaking, uh, continue to go up. Here's some of the raw water uh, nitrates that we have seen. Uh, I've got three sources in here. The blue is the Raccoon River, orange is the Des Moines River, and then the gray is the gallery. If you notice the gallery level, because it's influenced by the Raccoon River, it is always uh, less than the Raccoon River and is usually uh, a week delayed behind it. And so you, it will trend similarly, but always the concentrations are much lower uh, than the direct surface water. But you can see from this graph for the last five years, um, the uh, nitrates are going up and down um, can vary. In 2013, we missed a violation of exceeding the nitrate standard uh, by less than two days. In that example, uh, customer demand was going up. Uh, we were still having high concentrations of nitrogen in the water, and we had our eight vessels. Uh, we have the, one of the largest nitrate removal facilities uh, in the United States. We have eight uh, vessels of ion exchange vessels capable of removing 10 million gallons per day of the nitrogen uh, or the nitrates in the water. 
Uh, from that, we dilute, but we cannot, depending on the concentrations, we cannot do 75 million gallons per day or treat 75 million gallons per day. Luckily, the water temperature was coming up as demand was coming up. Um, we saw the algae start to form in the rivers, which started to decline the nitrogen or the nitrates in the rivers, and we were able to uh, narrowly miss an exceedance of 10 milligrams per liter in our finished water. Uh, we have several tools that we uh, use. Uh, certainly at Fluid Drive, the uh, nitrate removal facility, the ion exchange vessels is our primary tool, but we also can be uh, selective our sources. It was, as we discussed before, uh, we're fortunate enough to have two river sources we can choose from, and so we sample uh, both of those rivers and we look to see which one uh, is lower on nitrates at the time, and so we will select that river. So avoidance uh, is one of our tools that we use in, in being selective on which river source uh, we can take. Um, at our cellular oil treatment plant, we have ROs that will remove nitrates. Also, the radio collector wells that we have along the Des Moines River typically do not have high concentrations. It's a deeper aquifer, and we're getting a lot of groundwater blending, and so typically our nitrates are uh, relatively low in the wells in comparison to what we see in the gallery. And then we have at, uh, our McMullen water treatment plant, we do not have a um, nitrate removal facility there, but we do have uh, several off river storage areas. Here in the photo, uh, you'll see Maffet Reservoir. This is a reservoir that Des Moines Water Works constructed uh, decades ago. Uh, this was uh, primarily constructed at the time because of lack of water in the Raccoon River. Uh, when we had low flows, they would release water out of this reservoir into the Raccoon River and then pick it up downstream at the Fluor Drive treatment plant. We had since uh, 20 years ago built the, the new facility there and have tapped into that. And we use this reservoir not for only for quantity reasons, but for quality. Uh, we control the watershed. It's a very small watershed. So we control probably 90% of that watershed. Uh, the water quality is very good in there, low turbidity, uh, low nitrates. And so we can take that water and blend uh, with our radio collector well water to bring the levels down uh, below the uh, nitrate standard of 10 milligrams per liter. We also own a gravel pit on the side of the interstate where we pump water in from the river uh, when the water quality allows uh, into this gravel pit or old gravel pit, and then we uh, pull the water out. Uh, we can get some natural denitrification as a result of that. Uh, through this storage and be selective of when we're pumping water in and out uh, of that gravel pit. We have since purchased a couple other gra old gravel pits. We one day hope to connect all of those together. This graph is very busy, but it really illustrates um, some of the challenges that we see with nitrates. Uh, the light purple and the dark purple are the Raccoon and Des Moines River, the number of days that the water in the, those rivers were above the drinking water standard. So you can see it's very common um, to be above 50 uh, days uh, above the standard, at least in 1997 or 95 in that time. Uh, but then recently in 2008, we had a decline where things were very good. And we were hoping that maybe things were turning around, but unfortunately, shortly after that, we had a record breaking year in 2015, where we had to run a uh, nitrate removal facility for 177 days. So even though we had this decline, uh, uh, came back with a vengeance and we had 177 days. It appears right now we're in another decline with the water quality, at least for nitrate standards, uh, has been better, uh, but we're afraid that we're gonna see another uh, jump in that uh, in the next few years. We've also, by adding uh, the McMullen Water Treatment Plant, uh, the ASRs in 2007, the Sailorville Water Treatment Plant in 2011, along with some the Ankeny ASR and our third aquifer storage and recovery, we have other tools that really have allowed us to minimize the amount of water we have to take from uh, direct surface water. And so by having these other wells and the other treatment plants allows us to minimize the amount of water we have to take directly from the river to treat and allows us to use mostly groundwater um, in our treatment process with only supplementing surface water uh, during times where we have to have it for the quantity reasons. You can't talk about nitrates uh, without talking about concentrations, uh, about talking about load. So here's a graph of nitrate load. Uh, this is in metric tons, annual uh, metric tons. Again, you can see uh, that the trend uh, since the 1970s is going upward. 
or we're getting more loading of nitrates coming down the river. Talk a little bit about TOC. Uh, TOC is very uh, variable, again, depending on the time of the year. Uh, mostly we see it in the spring thaw, uh, but in 13 and 14, we had some unusual circumstances there uh, that created uh, higher than normal TOCs lasting much longer. I'll we'll kind of zoom in here on the last four years. Uh, you can see we get a lot of spikes uh, when the spring melt occurs. Uh, interesting enough, uh, typically the Raccoon River is very flashy, and so we will see uh, the spike in the TOCs first, and then the Des Moines River will follow, and typically not as high. Again, that is likely as a result of the Sailorville Reservoir that's uh, north of our intake on the Des Moines River acting as a buffer in that contact time that's happening in the reservoir. So many times when we see the river melts, we'll switch to the Des Moines River for a week or two, and then the Raccoon River will come back down. At that time, the Des Moines River concentrations are coming back up, and so we switch back to the Raccoon River. Again, it's kind of a dance of finding the river source that has uh, the least or the lowest TOC numbers, uh, but very seasonal, uh, typically when that spring melt occurs. Uh, in 2014, as we saw, we had some very high concentrations of TOCs over an extended period of time. Uh, for us, success is having filter effluent levels of less than one and a half milligrams per liter, which is the green line. You can see there was times where we were above five milligrams per liter uh, in our filter effluent, uh, and the rivers were uh, very high, sometimes almost near 30 or 20 uh, milligrams per liter. So very difficult conditions uh, at that time. Uh, which did uh, cause some uh, disinfection byproducts as a result of that. Uh, here's the filter effluent uh, TOC. Again, you can see we had a very high spike uh, occurring in that 2014 time, uh, but typically we are uh, well below two um, with that. Here's a different graph of uh, TTHMs leaving the plant or each of the plants. Uh, success in us for TTHMs leaving the plant is 0 0.04. Uh, the standard in the distribution system of the, uh, is 0 0.08 that you want to remain below. And so the last several years we have done well staying uh, below the 0 0.04 and, and trihalomethanes. Uh, but in, certainly in 2014, we struggled because of both of our source waters uh, being so high in TOC. Now I'll talk a little bit about ammonia. Uh, again, uh, another source that's typically seasonal uh, in the spring, but you can see these uh, large spikes that are occurring on both the Des Moines and Raccoon River with the gallery uh, more stable and much lower numbers, uh, very little ammonia level we typically see in the gallery. Uh, we'll kind of zoom in here on the last uh, eight years. And you can really see uh, what was happening in the filter effluent at uh, our, flu our fluor plant as long as with our McMullen plant of some of the spikes that we were seeing in that. And we really, anytime we get above 0.1 milligrams per liter, so this bottom line, we have to dose uh, hypochlorite very aggressively to neutralize that ammonia. If we do not do that, we get a lot of taste and odor problems and we can end up getting uh, low disinfectant out in the distribution system. So we have to dose very highly, sometimes 10 or more times the normal amount that we would need to in order to neutralize that ammonia. Now let's talk a little bit about algae and cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria is essentially the blue-green algae uh, that can occur. Um, here's a photo in 2014 of the Sailorville Reservoir. Again, this is the Reservoir Corps of Engineers Reservoir. Uh, built for flood control uh, north of the Des Moines area. Um, Des Moines Waterworks has a contract with the Corps of Engineers in the state of Iowa uh, for about two feet of the water in the reservoir so that we can use an emergency water supply to be able to um, ask for an additional release of the reservoir if need be during a drought. Uh, unfortunately, in 2014, uh, the water quality was horrific. As you can see, uh, a lot of cyanobacteria, a lot of blue-green algae, Certainly not something you want to recreate in, uh, and certainly had uh, toxins in there as well. Uh, some folks thought that was an odd thing that we don't see that very often. Well, a uh, few years later, this year again, uh, being in a drought situation, the same marina, same picture to the left, I took that this year, another big outbreak of cyanobacteria or blue-green algae uh, in the reservoir. The picture to the right, 
It was actually a picture the Corps of Engineers took and posted on Facebook, uh, warning uh, those that were going to use the beach. This is actually uh, the beach, one of the beaches at the reservoir. You can see how uh, the blue-green algae or the algae bloom was occurring there. Uh, the Corps of Engineers was taking test results and they were getting uh, greater than six parts per billion of uh, cyanotoxins in there. Uh, the EPL health advisory uh, to close beaches is eight. Uh, compared to the drinking water standard for finished water is 0.3 parts per billion. And so they knew that they were having extremely high levels of uh, toxins in the water. So they were posting to the public to be cautious because uh, any sample they took may uh, exceed the limits, even though it was below the standards on the samples they were taking. Uh, they made the quote of when in doubt, stay out. That's again, not something you want to recreate in and certainly not a good source water for us. Uh, what, what affects cyanobacteria growth? Well, certainly light intensity. Uh, like any plant material, they need light. So having long uh, days of sunlight in the summer months will certainly uh, help the growth and nutrient availability. Obviously in Iowa, our source waters uh, have a lot of nutrients, a lot of nitrates. Uh, cyanobacteria loves that nutrients and uh, takes off and uh, grows with that. Water temperature is also uh, a big factor. That's why we typically see in the late summer months and early fall months when the water temperature is warmest, we see the bigger outbreak of cyanobacteria growth. And then they also like calm waters. And so certainly the Sailorville Reservoir, when we're in a drought condition and there's not a lot of movement coming into the lake and not a lot of turnover in there, those calm waters can foster a lot of algae growth. We typically do not see um, a lot of cyanobacteria growth on the Raccoon River because a lot of the movement that's uh, forming there. But I think where we get the problems on the Raccoon River are very flashy as a result of other reservoirs or ponds that are having a lot of cyanobacteria growth occurring in there. And then when we get a large rain event, it's flushing that out into the, the Raccoon River where we all see those brief spikes occurring. In 2015, a result of the 2014 Toledo, Ohio uh, water crisis where they had uh, toxins in the uh, water, they issued this health advisory um, issuing uh, two cyanobacteria toxins that needed to be monitored and checked. And so in 2015, uh, microcystins uh, was one of those and slender spermosum was the other. For us, uh, microcystins is the one toxin that we are typically seeing both in the Des Moines and Raccoon River. Uh, and they set the drinking water standard of 0.3 parts per billion in the finished reservoir of that water. With that, uh, Des Moines Water Works created a cyanotoxin management plan, um, having four stages to that. And the first thing we do is look at bacteria counts. And so we're, uh, we know that when the bacteria counts on cyanobacteria get very high, that is when cyanotoxins can form. Not all blue-green algae will create toxins. Uh, it's a good to know or it's really important part of it, but certainly as the bacteria counts get higher, uh, there's more likelihood that toxins could form. And so we start with doing counts. Once we see high counts, uh, we now have uh, equipment in-house in our lab, ELISA machine that we can do toxin testing. And this summer we've been doing toxin testing almost every day because of the high cyanobacteria counts on the Des Moines River. Uh, it's important to know the conventional water treatment, um, powdered activated carbon and chlorine will reduce toxins in the finished water, but it will not completely eliminate. And so we know we can reduce the toxins, uh, but we really need to stay away from them because if there's high levels in our surface waters, uh, there's a good possibility that some of it will uh, push through uh, the treatment process and could end up in the finished water uh, resulting in a public notice. Here's just typical green algae. Uh, again, we can get lots of spikes with this. Green algae is more of a nuisance for us. It can create taste and odor problems. It can also uh, cause our filters to plug or have long, shorter run times. It can also reduce our treatment capacity uh, because the filters are not able to uh, pass as much water through them as they're fouling uh, much more rapidly than they typically would. Cyanobacteria is similar in that regard, where we can affect uh, taste and odor issues. It can also affect um, the filter performance. Uh, but you can see in this example, it is, uh, can be very flashy as well. 
And then, uh, but typically if we do not see big issues on the Raccoon River for the cyanobacteria. However, in 2016, we had an event uh, that kind of came out uh, of nowhere for us. It really was very concerning where we had a very high amount of counts on the cyanobacteria uh, that caught us off guard. Uh, it was so flashy that it um, in, required immediate change as part of that. Here is this year's uh, cyanobacteria. Um, this drought has been uh, causing problems for us. You can see the Des Moines River, the orange, uh, having high counts since July, uh, essentially putting us on edge of looking at that river. We've done a lot of tests with the toxins and we will see that we have high toxin levels in there uh, as well. But you can see that we had an event in August where the cyanobacteria on the Raccoon River again spiked up. Uh, fortunately, there was no toxins in the water at the time and it uh, came back down uh, relatively rapidly. But for us as operators, when the cyanobacteria counts are high at both of our river sources, that is certainly a concern for us because if both uh, start to have high levels of toxins, uh, we have uh, very little things that we can do and we know that we're limited. Uh, on that. Uh, back in 2016, I showed you that spike that we had. Uh, we had high cyanobacteria counts on both. Uh, we originally were on the Raccoon River because we had not seen any detectable limits of toxins. Unfortunately, that spike did bring down toxins in the Raccoon River uh, that did come through uh, part of the plant before we detected it in the river and were able to switch uh, back to the Des Moines and unfortunately did uh, have some breakthrough of toxins uh, into the finished water uh, for a day or two. Uh, we did notify the DNR of that event. Uh, this was about two years after the event uh, in Toledo and a year after the EPA health advisory came on. Uh, luckily, the concentrations were not. It was more of a public notice uh, to them and they, by switching sources, we were able to avoid uh, that, so not having immediate health threats uh, as a result of that event. It certainly made us aware of how uh, diligent we need to be and how flashy the rivers can be and checking water quality is important. Here's the microcystins for this year. Again, these are the toxins. Uh, you can see that we did have a small event uh, where the toxin levels did go up on the Raccoon River. We were able to switch to the Des Moines River at that time. Uh, the levels came back down on the Raccoon River, which we switched back. At the same time, the Des Moines River started to go up and it has continued to go up to where we're having uh, levels of greater than six parts per billion uh, at our intake uh, currently. And so for us, the Des Moines River, uh, most of the summer has been unusable because the amount of toxins that we're seeing in there and that we know that the treatment process cannot remove all those toxins. As we've discussed, uh, for us, uh, we need to choose the river that's uh, the, it's not the largest offender, uh, much like nitrates. Uh, we're taking samples every day, looking at the water quality in both rivers to make a decision of which river has the best water quality for us uh, to be the most successful. Uh, cyanotoxins can be in two forms. They can be in an, uh, as a particle or intracellular. Uh, this is the better form for us uh, because it can be easily, more easily removed through a coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, and filtration. Uh, much easier to remove a particle form uh, than it is in a dissolved form. However, in 2016, uh, those were in an intracellular form. We had good particle removal, but it wasn't sufficient enough uh, to uh, remove all of it. As a dissolved component or extracellular, it's much more difficult to remove. Uh, have to use powder activated carbon and chlorine and other oxidants under proper conditions, uh, but it's much uh, easier to do it as a particle form or intracellular. Again, as operators, we know our margins are very narrow uh, for the half a million central islands that we uh, serve. Uh, the, there's very dynamic changes in the river water quality and the toxins uh, during backwashes can actually concentrate within the plant. And so typically backwashes are recycled through the plant uh, but during uh, the times where we start to see toxins, uh, we have to do extra measures to uh, temporary piping uh, to not uh, recycle uh, backwash water from the filters or we can actually concentrate them within the plant. What future tools do we need? Uh, this is uh, something that is us as engineers and operators here continuing to look at and what can we do 
certainly one of the things that we could do is expand our cellular water treatment plant that uh, UF and RO plant uh, is very capable of removing uh, most of these toxins or all the toxins through ROs. Also, that does not take any surface water and is using that shallow uh, groundwater supply. And so it's a much better water quality and we do not, do not have to worry about water quality issues as much as we do at the other two plants. Uh, we could provide additional off-river storage. Uh, we talked about those three gravel pits, expanding those, uh, making more off-river storage so that we could avoid uh, the rivers uh, for a month or two during these peak uh, demand periods. Our third option is to create a new river bank filtration uh, for our fluor water treatment plant, uh, which we call the North Wellfield. And this one is really uh, the most attractive uh, to me is I think we need to get back to uh, groundwater as our primary source and really try to avoid surface water in Iowa because the surface water is so poor and trying to treat all of that is uh, very challenging and takes very robust treatment process. So if we can get shallow groundwater that has been riverbank filtration, uh, we can have a lot more success. And so the benefits of riverbank filtration, uh, removal of bacteria and viruses, removes algae, uh, algal toxins, reduces turbidity. We can get particle removal of TOCs, uh, which will help us on our disinfection byproducts, uh, reduces the nitrate concentrations. Uh, we can even get removal of some herbicides and pesticides uh, through that. So there's a lot of water quality reasons of using riverbank filtration versus just taking straight from the river. And that's something that we would like to do. Uh, one of the other benefits, side benefits of that is warmer water temperatures in the winter. And this is important because when we start taking a lot of uh, surface water that is 32 degrees, and we're mixing that with a little bit of groundwater that we have, it really drives our water temperatures, our finished water temperatures down. And typically when we see water temperatures below 40 degrees in January and February, we get a lot of thermal expansion in our old cast iron mains, and that's when we get a lot of water main breaks. And so by having uh, warmer water, finished water leaving, and not using that 32 degree water coming in from the frozen rivers, uh, we can actually prevent uh, less water main breaks. Uh, one of our last slides here, this just shows the Des Moines River Valley, um, our intake here at Prospect Park. Um, we would like to, we're doing a study along this valley south of the interstate to see if we could put some of those alluvial wells. Um, we think that uh, along this Beaver Creek Valley, that uh, one radio collector well could get us more than 10 million gallons per day. This is probably the deepest part of the aquifer along the Des Moines River, uh, where it's maybe 40 or 50 feet deep. So if we could uh, get two or three wells along here, along with pipeline back to our river intake, uh, we could, between these wells and our gallery system, we could nearly be off of uh, the Raccoon River or the Des Moines River taking straight surface water and all the challenges that we see seasonally by taking direct surface water. Hey, um, Kyle. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you very much for all that, Kyle. Um, I know there's a ton of stuff to share and um, a lot of really good stuff going on and a lot of, a lot of problems that you're facing, but uh, unique solutions and trying to find ways to work, work around those. Um, I'm going to make Catherine our presenter here. And so Kyle kind of walked us through some of the operational challenges um, and kind of how they how they treat the water and, and what they uh, you're on your presenter view, Catherine. Yep, I'm gonna switch over. Okay. And so now Catherine's gonna talk a little bit about um, River Network and their drinking water guide um, and kind of what you guys can do as citizens and how this all impacts you as both citizens and consumers. So um, we're running yeah. a little Running a little behind schedule, yeah. Catherine, take as long as you need. Um, hopefully folks can stick with us here. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop talking and pass it off to you, thanks. Great, thanks so much. Thanks for um, having me on today. And um, so I'm Director of Science and Policy at River Network, working from North Carolina. And a little bit about River Network. Um, some of you may be members and we are a nationwide organization that connects and supports people working on water across the country. And it, um, across a number of different issues, including drinking water. Um, you may be familiar with our annual river rally, um, and we provide training and support throughout the year. 
So I want to talk about sort of a step back from where Kyle was, because of course he's the person who's like doing the amazing work of, you know, figuring out how to treat and deliver your water on a daily basis. Um, but for us, I want to talk about a little bit like the why, the what, and then introduce you to our drinking water guide, um, an overview of some of the sections, and then provide you with some additional resources to use. Um, so just for starters, I mean, in a big picture, this is right, the, the hydrologic map of the United States, and we're filled with all these tributaries. And so for River Network, when we were thinking about this, you know, it's like, okay, two thirds of our country roughly gets its water supply from our surface waters, um, creeks, rivers, lakes, reservoirs, um, and then the rest right from groundwater. And so it's super important for us to make those connections between our rivers and our drinking water. Um, and it's funny that someone like me who's worked in water a long time, you know, I came at it from sort of the riparian zones and the what's in the water and what lives in the water, um, but recognizing really that drinking water is the place that touches everyone, or water touches everyone. So um, there's an important connection for the quality of our drinking water, but just also to connect with people across the country. Then the other context here is that, um, is of course that, you know, that we have seen in recent years um, a real focus and sort of honestly just a recognition that in some places we're having these threats for drinking water. Um, so whether it's one that Kyle talked about um, or lead, it's still um, quality problems, but also access. A lot of people don't in the country, surprisingly, don't even have access to healthy water. And that may be because there's not water lines or maybe drought or their water may have been shut off. Um, and so this is a recent, this sort of collides with this, this idea of that we're needing, we need to raise our water rates to be able to pay for the infrastructure we need, but at the same time, there's a lot of people who can't afford water rates. So we have to figure out how to, to address these solutions together and look at how to protect the environment and provide water to people and make sure that it's affordable so people can have the water they need to drink, to stay healthy. Um, and this issue really of equity has become, you know, it's been there for a long time. Um, who gets water, who doesn't, um, where the places are where people don't have safe water to drink. But our COVID crisis has really sort of laid bare some of these issues in terms of now that people recognize you have to have water to wash your hands, to stay safe. Um, and that not everyone has that access. So at River Network, we really started to think about, you know, water um, as a right and trying to think about how we do center some of that work on equity is part of our work as we're thinking about drinking water across the spectrum from the source water all the way to the tap. So our Vault River Network is really in our sphere of drinking water is to create a more informed and engaged national network of community advocates for safe, clean, affordable, and sustainable drinking water. So this is our uh, drinking water cohort we helped support a couple of years ago and it was groups from all over the country who were working on drinking water in some way. And so we brought them together and had a lot of peer learning, brought in experts, visited um, water treatment plants, um, and trying to, again, provide training and support. So um, citizens are able to engage in their communities, whatever the issue is, um, to come out with safer water, and that includes working with their water utility and water system. So when we started this work a couple years ago, um, we recognized that there wasn't um, there wasn't really like a place to go for drinking water. Like if I was when I started looking at, I'm like, okay, where do I go to get information on drinking water? And there's a lot of different, there's a ton of information out there, but in terms of for, from a citizen perspective, there wasn't one place to go. So we decided our first step needed to be to sort of put this together in what we call the drinking water guide. So we, uh, we had a, a committee, an advisory group of citizens, drinking water utilities, and others from around the country, many in the Great Lakes, and to try to help us think about okay, what, what, how, do we, how do we orient this, um, what needs to be in it, and um, what, what are the topics. So they were super helpful in both providing the input in the front end and also reviewing the guide. Since it's been published, we've also provided it and transcreated it into Spanish with our partners, Corazon Latino. Um, you can find both copies of our drinking water guide in English and Spanish um, at the website below. And so the outline for the drinking water guide is the following sections. And again, this is sort of informed by our network and what we understood as sort of like the interest in the different parts of drinking water. But one is where does our drinking water come from, the source water? What does my drinking water system do? 
what frameworks are in place to make sure our water is safe and sort of the policy related issues. Um, and then what is my drinking water cost and what is my water bill paying for? I'm trying to understand that. And then something about climate change. Uh, what can I do about it? What are the things to look for? And then finally, for most of our um, network really, what are the community action and advocacy pieces that I can do? And when you go look at the drinking water guide, you'll see that each section has um, you know, some text, some case studies, additional resources, and then also questions to ask at the end. So you can go through each section and flip between them just to get the parts you need to get to access. So I'm going to step through the sections just to give you examples of what's in them. So section one is on source water. And so we talk about, you know, how do you find the source of your drinking water if you don't know? What are the strategies for protecting source water? Um, as Kyle said, it can be hard unless you own a lot of the watershed. So how does that look in places where you have to have incentives and regulations or multi-jurisdictional bodies in place? So we have some case studies about how that can work. Um, with the community groups working um, to protect source water. Our second section is drinking water system. And this is um, this is basically, you know, when we started, we're like, and we're thinking about it, like, okay, the drinking water systems, you know, people like Kyle are doing so much, but a lot of us don't really have an appreciation for what does my drinking water system do. So we really kind of go through the nuts and bolts of who manages who manages water system, what's the governance like, what's what's involved in water treatment, um, a little bit about water storage, distribution, and water systems also are in charge of making sure that you get a consumer confidence report in public notification if something goes wrong. Um, and so there's really a lot that's going on with water systems, and so it's helpful for people to kind of understand what's on their plate. So as you start to work with water systems, you can come in with an appreciation of that. Um, we're working on a project right now about building relationships with water systems, so that'll be a resource we'll be able to share with you um, in the coming months. The third section is policy protection, so this is really this, about the Safe Drinking Water Act for the most part, even though um, we also talk a little bit about how the Clean Water Act can be used to protect um, drinking water, how the regulatory process works at the federal level, what are the opportunities for protecting drinking water and policy at the state level, um, and also how the feds and the states work together and a little bit about enforcement. Uh, so that's a big, big, big part of that. And so a lot of people are really interested in digging in for like what are the leverage points you can work, look at um, in terms of drinking water protection. So section four, um, and I, oh, we alluded to this sort of, um, there's this real, right now, you know, we see this happening all over the country. It's really important to provide more, more uh, funding at the federal level so water systems can have the money to invest what they need to. But as of right now, a lot of the money is spent at the local level, um, and it does cost a lot of money to deliver water to treat it and to deliver water to people's houses. And so as water rates are going up, we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we balance um, the need to invest with the need to make sure everyone has access to the like amount of water they need for their health um, every day. So this um, this section really tackled that a little bit, talks about drinking water infrastructure, water loss, um, how what, what the issues are related to water portability and some of the sort of questions around that, how do you measure it? Um, and then also some of the initial approaches for addressing water affordability, which include programs a water utility might have like a customer assistance program or possibly a rate structure that is um, that makes it makes the water more affordable for those who are less able to pay it. Um, we're also doing more work in this area, so this spring definitely look for our equitable infrastructure toolkit that will cover in much more depth and much more accessible about infrastructure and affordability. Section five is climate change impacts, and um, you know Kyle talked about droughts and floods, and um, you know we're seeing right now, of course, in California with all the fires that now that's releasing toxic chemicals into people's water supply. So the whole cascade of effects on climate change and drinking water that. Um, you know, we need to keep our eye on in terms of preparing for climate change. Um, and so the questions here really have to do with, you know, is your water utility considering that? What does it look like for your region? What would you need to do if you were going to advocate for some real uh, for climate preparedness? Um, so this is a, a, big, a big topic. And finally, our section on community action and advocacy. And so this is a section, if you just go to one section and you find out the basics, this is a section to go to. It's based on questions and um, kind of short answers 
and there's a lot here, but you know, a lot of filters. Who do I go to to get help? Um, what are the things I can advocate for at the different levels and things like that? So um, for us, we're building a lot of tools off of this and trying to help support people as they consider the ways they might address um, drinking water, community action and advocacy where they live because you know, the issues are going to be different, the communities are different. And so um, trying to help people tailor that and understand the issues in their own community. So I want to leave you with some resources. Um, so this is the Drinking Water Guide website. Um, our Equitable Infrastructure Toolkit is will be coming out in the spring of 2021. So look for that. We also currently um, facilitate and organize a regular group on drinking water and COVID, which is just sort of become more broadly um, a listserv and regular calls about drinking water issues. So I put the, the um, the link right there, you can find it on our website at rivernetwork.org. Um, feel free to join that and, and join our calls every other week. It's a really great sort of information peer sharing place to discuss issues, um, get your questions answered. So, Zach, I am going to stop it there, and I know we want to pause and take some time for questions. Awesome. Um, thank you very much, Catherine. Kyle, oh, if you want, you can turn your uh, webcam back on so we can do questions real quick. Sorry, I'm managing my two screens at once. Uh, confusing my computer. Okay. All right. Um, thanks again, both of you, for everything you guys just shared with us. Um, a lot of great steps. And, Catherine, I'm sure there's a lot of people who, I shared the, the link for the guide in the chat. I'm sure there's a lot of people who have that link pulled up or they're gonna go and dig into that a little bit later after this. Um, okay. Kyle, there's a lot of people who had questions about, um, uh, you know, sources of pollutants in, in the Raccoon and Des Moines rivers. And I kind of answered that a lot of times in Iowa, it just comes from non-point sources, which are uh, difficult regulate and you know difficult to deal with and so it kind of just takes a community-wide or a statewide societal push to get that because um, like I mentioned yeah they're not regulated like a point source would be and so that's a big challenge for you guys but people were really curious about the different sources of pollution in Iowa and so I said it's non-point a lot of it in Iowa just because of land uses um, agricultural sources but Somebody asked um, way back in the beginning of your presentation, Kyle, someone was curious what caused the peak pumping back in 2012. In 2012, it was probably um, it was er early enough in the year where people's yards, it was all irrigation. Our peak pumpage is primarily irrigation. And so uh, a lot of people with the, want to keep their yards green. And so if we get a long drought uh, or dry period or after the early spring, we get a warm period, that's really when we start to see our big, uh, big irrigation demand take off. Typically at the end of the year, a lot of people uh, do not want to irrigate their yard towards the end of the year because they've had high water bills. And so we see that decline, simply decline. Uh, certainly the peak would have been mostly irrigation load and probably some cooling load uh, also, um, but mostly irrigation. That makes sense. Um, let me scroll down here real quick, sorry. Someone also uh, was curious, one of your um, um, pollutants that you made a graph for was THM and they were asking what that was. THM is trihalomethanes and it's, uh, it's a disinfection byproduct as a result of chlorine uh, and TOC. And so that is regulated in the distribution system. And so uh, it's, it's regulated as a, a rolling four quarters. It's not an individual grab. We take uh, samples once a quarter and then it's averaged over that rolling four quarters. And so it's a, it's a disinfection byproduct as a result of uh, chlorine that we, is regulated. Um, so the, the drinking water guide was really neat. What kinds of groups are you sharing that with and how are you trying get the word out with that yeah i mean we've shared it pretty as widely as we can essentially and we've been at um, a lot of the regional conferences around the country and um 
and in a lot of training groups, supporting some groups in the Great Lakes directly, and we're happy to, you know, have it shared out and, and, and join groups for presentations. So um, please feel free to contact me if, if, that, if that's of interest. And I think our next steps really on that are trying to, um, because even though the guide is accessible itself, we're helping, we're making a few more products or even like sort of the next level of accessibility that you, know, you really could use as a handout or something. So that's what we've heard from people is like, the simpler the better. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kyle, someone had a question about, um, they said, tell us about your efforts for clean water conservation, uh, sustainability. What about education for your users to conserve, et cetera? So it kind of seems like they're asking about community engagement and education. What, what kind of stuff do you guys do related to that? Sure. Um, the Moines Water is really is uh, certainly is really think source water is important, and we try to do a lot of outreach uh, with that. Um, we, we offer uh, classes um, to help uh, teach people what the process is of water treatment and things like that, and source water. And so we do a Citizens Water Academy every year, uh, where we uh, have a class for multiple days, where we try to teach people about where their water comes from and the challenges that we have, much more in depth. That I was able to get into uh, today. We also tour the water, some of the water treatment plants to show people uh, the process. Uh, certainly we, we reach out to the public and, and things and talk about source water and that was uh, you know one of the reasons of the lawsuit was trying to bring awareness to that and trying to get regulation to regulate those point source pollutants and things and um, that we've done and so we try to do several things to, to educate the public uh, with that. A, another question for Kyle, um, just kind of changing topics a little bit. Someone asked, will moving to primarily shallow well infrastructure see increased water quantity concerns in times of drought, or do they tend to be more drought resilient? No, certainly we're, our alluvial aquifers or the shallow groundwater are uh, reduced capacity during drought periods, and so uh, we can see that, um, and so that, that is a more as a concern, certainly ideally we'd have a lot more wells so that we were always had plenty of well capacity to do that but it's always a cost uh, analysis the just doing the well field up north that's you know probably a more than a 20 million dollar project and so uh, to be able to construct enough wells that we would always be able on groundwater all the time uh, is possible but certainly would be very expensive to our customers and there's you know a lot of making customers aware of why is your water bill going up and why are we needing to do these things uh, to protect you and to protect the water the finished water and so it, it's always a challenge between rates and infrastructure to be able to handle those challenges that are coming down um i've got a question for you personally catherine um so kyle shared a lot of great stuff from des moines which is a large well for iowa it's a large city um what kinds of challenges and um you know solutions would smaller municipalities face you know in, in rural rural areas that maybe don't have as many resources but they're still de dealing with pollution issues and you know that gets passed on to the consumer if they're not able to, to clean their water and make it available yeah, yeah no it's a good question because and if you look at the number of systems in the united states there are like there are many, many more, like thousands of small systems um, who are serving a really small percentage of the population, but they also face, you know, having the same capacity, some of the same capacity issues and having to do some of the same treatment, et cetera, that a uh, larger utility would. So um, it's really hard. So there's some rural water associations that specific, specifically help and build capacity, but I think um, from a citizen perspective, you know, it's interesting, we were talking to the West Virginia Rivers Coalition recently, and they work with a lot of the smaller systems in their state, and they said, they said for us as a watershed group, it's easier to work with the smaller systems because they, the smaller systems sometimes need more sort of help and they're like looking for partnership opportunities. So I think if you're a citizen group and thinking about that, if you have a you look at this is a small system in your community, there could be really good opportunities there. But besides that, smaller systems also there's a lot of discussion around when there's opportunity for smaller systems to either share services among them, so they don't have to do all the work themselves on things like human resources or consolidation, which can be more you know, politically fraught, but it's sometimes um, just kind of the elegant solution to pursue in some places. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, well, we're about five minutes past our targeted end time. 
and I see some people are starting to, to drop off in our attendance. So I think this would be a good place to go ahead and uh, leave. Um, just a reminder to everybody who's in our audience that this is recorded and we'll be sending out a follow-up email with um, the video, which is gonna be posted on our YouTube channel. And just wanna say thanks again to Catherine and Kyle, and thank you to everybody in our audience today for joining us. Awesome, thank you, have enough. Thank you. Yep, we'll be back um, in October with our next webinar, so keep your eyes up for communications regarding that. Thanks, folks, enjoy the rest of your day.